we need to optimize on click-through rate. We need to achieve an extremely high click-through rate. So we could have a low CAC essentially mm -hmm. and, and create profitability. So that was first sort of the high level mandate, achieve a high click-through rate to have a low CAC. What can you learn from a marketing leader who helped take a startup to a $2 billion valuation? Hello and welcome to Mobile Heroes Uncensored. My name is John Coots here and of course our co-host today as always is Peggy Ann Saltz. And today we are chatting with a special someone who's helped take a news app into a global juggernaut. It aggregates over 3,000 global sources, has tens of millions of readers, has raised hundreds of millions of dollars, and has achieved the highest monthly user time among all news apps. That's incredibly impressive. Peggy, who are we chatting with today? Well, I love unicorns, John. So <laughs> do you? <laughs> I do indeed. It's always an interesting story. And today we're going to have that and more because we have Fabian Pierre Nicolaus. He's an advisor for Smart News, the news curation app you're telling us about, helping users find quality news beyond the filter bubble. Really important. He has a long track record at Smart News. He was their VP of marketing and before that, the head of marketing. Today he's an advisor, but hey, he's also a co founder of a startup in stealth mode. We might hear about it. Uh, and an advisor to Million Victories, a gaming company. And before all of that, well, Fabian was VP of marketing at App Annie, now Data AI. Held positions at Perfect World Entertainment, Ubisoft, L'Oreal, you name it, it's there. And again, doing my research as always, his colleagues sum him up as very simply and succinctly, quote, if there's anything you should know about Fabian, it's that he will throw himself wholeheartedly into his duties 100%, maybe 200%, <laughs> maybe. meet his high standards, and he will advocate for your growth. And he is the person any company needs to scale and get ahead. That's why we have him on the show. Fabian, no pressure, right? Welcome to the show. <laughs> Yeah, no pressure at all, but hopefully, you know, the French accent doesn't prevent your listeners from hearing me. And I know it's always the challenge, despite, you know, spending 15 years in Silicon Valley, the accent is not going away. <laughs> it's all good. We like the accent. It's charming and you're very understandable. You know what? Peggy does a research. Sometimes I do as well. I just clicked through to LinkedIn just half a moment during that long intro. And it said something like 19, maybe it said 29 experiences that you've got on LinkedIn. You have jumped around a little bit, my friend, and mm -hmm. you have worked for a lot of places. How the heck did that all happen? Well, you know, at the very beginning of my career, uh, I was always dreaming about the video game industry, but first you got to, you know, prove yourself. So I had, um, you know, different jobs to support myself through school, which I'm sure, you know, it's the experience of many people in the US and in Europe. Uh, school is expensive, right? Um, but ultimately I was able, when I completed my MBA at L'Oreal Finance to say, hey, what do I truly want to do? To pass on a job at L'Oreal and focus really on video games, which was one of my core passion. I was reading about video game entrepreneur when I was 12, 13 years old, and dreaming about the Silicon Valley. And so I joined Ubisoft. One thing I noticed through the career at Ubisoft in France and then in the U.S. is more and more of the gamers were coming to focus group to discuss about their favorite game, you know, Far Cry or Splinter Cell or something. And they were bringing their phone. And more and more, as they were answering the question and discussing with the moderator, they were playing. I was like, hmm, something is happening there. Something so powerful that those gamers are willing to step away from talking about their favorite game. That's when I essentially joined the mobile scene, you know, late 2011, where the free-to-play was starting to rise. And that was, frankly, like the other trend that was seeing is like, you have a generation that doesn't want to pay the 60 bucks, you know, price tag anymore mm -hmm. up front, mm -hmm. right? That would like to first enjoy the product before they commit some money to it. Uh, and I was essentially always sort of following and embracing what the consumer was doing was sort of, you know, how I was defining my career. Then after 10 years in gaming, I think part of me was, you know, I became a dad and I started having the ambition to 
join more mission-driven companies. And so that's when I joined Smart News versus other opportunities in mobile games, because once you've been for many years in mobile games, you always have more opportunities in mobile games. Um, you know, quality information matters uh, to me. And luckily, this was the mission of the company, and I felt that could make the U.S., which was my daughter's country and then became my country, if it could be at least marginally trying to improve the state of the country, that was, you know, after 2016 election, so be it. And that's why, you know, I, I joined Smart News. And then now my new venture is about diversity, equity, inclusion, which again, like this mission-driven aspect is something I want to add to the following the consumer path. Love that path. It goes everywhere, John. It just shows serendipity is awesome, right? <laughs> it all fits together at some level. I want to continue with the startup, right? Listen to the podcast over at the Business of Apps. You were there talking about your startup having to do with diversity, inclusion, and deals with changing companies' biases on topics like racism and sexism. Now, that sounds really cool. It sounds like a technology that's very relevant. What will it do exactly? What can you tell us about this? Yeah. So, the, you know, I had to deploy with my colleagues at Smart News a DNI um, solution after everything that happened in 2020. We started with like traditional training, and that wasn't enough to truly affect the way people were thinking and behaving. So, we started looking at platform. And one thing I realized is that there was a pretty big gap in the market where a lot of those, um, you have traditional training companies who tend to cater only to people already convinced that change is needed. Uh, and it's really hard to do when you have a remote workforce. Then on the other end, you have those platforms that were built, I will say, in a way that's not very engaging. So macro learnings, like you commit five hours and you're going to be a better ally or five hours, you know, about this topic. The problem is in the modern workforce, I don't think we all have five hours to sit in front of very long lecturing. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> no. um, so we were like, okay, let's do quite the opposite. Let's be a SaaS platform so you could deploy to everyone. But let's as well focus on micro learning. So each topic is going to be, you know, 10 to 15 minutes journey all in. Each video is like 30 seconds to a minute and a half, right? So it's a lot more like TikTok generation. It's the um, TikTok than... of HR. It's the TikTok of, of learning. Love it. Corporate learning. And, oh. Yeah. And so as a result, in the funnel, we have 93% people that complete the training that they start, which is very important because you create all these data points where there is like polls, there is videos. And as a result, HR team could say, hmm, we have 30% people in this business unit or within this specific team, let's say sales that report seeing sexist behaviors. Let's act on it and do a follow-up to prevent the risk before it materializes because lawsuits are expensive. Restaffing mm -hmm. staff for churning, right? If you're different and you don't feel included in your team, you're going to churn is expensive. And last but not least, the damage to your brand reputation is extensive. I mean, we've seen in gaming, right? Ubisoft, Activision, Riot Games, all hit by big lawsuit, but as well, simply by a lot of angers, right, from their yep. fans, because they were like essentially wow. uh, discriminating against specific categories of people. So my take is that there is something big to do. And uh, luckily, I think, even though we're bootstrapped so far, might be raising soon, there is, I think, a, such a strong demand that we've closed many like major clients, like both scale up company, but as well, you know, major banks in Europe, uh, in, in Inoken and, you know, a, a bunch of like really large companies that just want to change that. Very, very, very cool. And you're right. Those lawsuits are not only expensive, they're bad PR. It's bad for people. People don't want to work in an environment where they don't feel valued, where they don't feel safe, where they don't feel comfortable. So you lose good people from that. And we've seen as well in some of the biggest potential mergers, some of those issues come up, including one that Microsoft was recently involved in, and that mm -hmm. imperils the future of the company. I want to turn to Smart News. You spent over five years there. You've got users in 150 countries, around 20 million monthly average users. Talk about your user acquisition strategy there and your monetization strategy. How did it work? Yeah. So, of course, you know, there is the Japan side and the U.S. side. So I'm going to focus on the U.S. side, which was the fastest growing in, in the last like three or four years. Japan, we're sort of arch leader in the new space. Um, a lot of their acquisition is well offline with like partnership and TV campaigns. And, you know, the offline is, is, is almost half of their acquisition. But focusing on the U.S., I think uh, coming in this space, and that was my first experience with in-app advertising as the revenue driver. 
So we don't have any other source of monetization. It's purely based on ads. Some of them we will have share with publishers. Some of them we sell our UI and we just keep you know, the entire revenue. And so, as you could imagine, the ad monetization means everyone monetize, right? Almost everyone gets ad serve if they are at least, you know, based in the U.S. But the problem is your LTV really accrues over a long period of time and typically is like lower than when you're looking at like mobile games, casino games, you know, those categories, which was more my experience before. So I was like, okay, we need to optimize and click through rate. We need to achieve an extremely high click through rate. So we could have a low CAC essentially mm -hmm. and, and create profitability. So that was first sort of the high level mandate, achieve a high click through rate to have a low CAC. And then the other aspect was it's a numbers game. You need to achieve really large number of users, right? When you have a driven business model. So you can't be like very happy with a small number of people because by <laughs> definition, you know, the LTV is low. So I was like, how do you have as well large scale? And so from this logic, I look at the landscape. So on the Facebook side, we build a lot of automation technology, leveraging the content from within the app, the news, um, targeting it, including, you know, hyper local campaigns. So we have 3000 local pages, let's say San Francisco news, that's going to show you things that are San Francisco news that people click on and in turn, they then install the app. So that's for the Facebook side. We have preloads. Looking at the market, you know, Android is much bigger than iOS. iOS having Apple News on every device is, and Apple being pretty aggressive at promoting that. Um, so I was like, okay, you know, preload is on off an underlooked channel, but at the end of the day, when you have a very broad use case and you can't pay too much, it's a really solid channel. So it really helped with our growth, Iron Source, Digital Turbine with our partners, and you know, all the big carriers like AT&T, T-Mobile, and so on, they work with everyone in the US at this point. And last but not least, you know, TV, um, people tend to, again, think of TV as like a high cost channel, but when you think about your persona and your users, <laughs> there is obviously a clear news use case on TV. And so we, we advertise CNN, Fox news, you know, MSNBC, and we were very successful as well with the debates. So we did the democratic debates, uh, sponsorship, and you could generate like 10, 20, 30,000 install in, in a few minutes, just with an ad that's well placed. Um, so that's. Some of the channels we've, we've used, it's, you know, there's a long list, but that's the main ones. I want to follow up just for a moment there because it's ad supported, as you were saying. And Peggy and I were recently chatting with somebody who said that with ATT and SK Ad Network, there's been like a 10 year jump in CPM. And I didn't really fully understand what she meant by that, to be 100% honest. And we didn't really get a chance to dive into it and dig into it. Have you seen a change in what's happening with your monetization via ads after yeah. ATP? Yes, uh, I you know can't comment on the specific specifics, but you know in short, iOS CPMs took a big hit, right? Because mm -hmm. by definition, you have a lot more sort of unqualified traffic if you could think of it this way. Uh, and Android went the other way around, which for us since. Uh, three quarter of our user base in the US is an Android was actually a plus. <laughs> we end up benefiting from the change. Maybe um, that was it. Maybe she was mostly Android, Peggy. And maybe that's why she said it was like a 10 year jump for her. And it was just yeah. better that monetization. Must it. That must have been it because yeah. uh, po a negative mm -hmm. to a positive. I was, I couldn't figure it out, but this makes perfect <laughs> sense. So you had a great time. I want to get back to the product because we're talking about how you monetize it and the market dynamics. But at the end of the day, you know, you also pride yourself on a great app being beyond the filter bubble, solving that. It's a great product and you have been driven by product first, but then you switch to consumer driven. What do you mean by that and why the shift? Yeah. So the shift was, you know, when you're based in Japan, there is a very fairly homogeneous country and culture, right? So uh, if you essentially have a pool of talent inside your company that's diverse enough, you have the capability to typically build for the entire the country at large, right? And sort of have all the keen sight and finger on the pulse. There is always, you know, specific age group and so on who might be underrepresented uh, in, in your company. But overall, you could build a product for the entire country. 
But in the US, the diversity of the consumer with all the, you know, the belief, um, you know, the location, like the lifestyles, the origin, the country of origin, right? It's a country that's built, that's a giant melting pot, makes it really hard to just based on your workforce, you know, understand what the consumer wants. So the, the mental shift that I help our C-level and, and our company do with, with my team was really around saying, hey, you need to go and engage qualitatively, quantitatively with the consumers. You need to understand how it's sort of divided up in the market. You need to pick who you want to go after and you need to understand their pain points and build from those pain points. You can't say, well, I think they want this, right? You, you have to truly listen and engage with them. <laughs> and so, you know, that's the switch we had to do essentially with, with the methodology behind it. I love it. I love it. There's product-led growth and there's also growth that's led by understanding your customers. And you've already, you already talked about being super hyper-local. Uh, that's an extension of this as well. One other thing that you said recently is that you borrowed from big tech to make smart news the app it is today. What on earth does that mean and what did you do? The way I see big tech and to name names like, to, let's say, Facebook, um, but it's the case as well at Snap and a series of those companies, is they are always looking both, you know, at their competition uh, and they are looking at their consumer, you know, emerging demands, and they're trying new features all the time to meet that. So looking at the competition, I think the most famous example is, you know, Snapchat was taking off with their Snapchat stories and you had Facebook be like, hmm, that looks great. How about we add that to Instagram and to Facebook, right? <laughs> and as a result, it sort of like blocked Snapchat further growth in the US, right? By delivering on this consumer demand of something very visual, you know, very short that could, you could publish uh, quickly to, to all your friends. And this is something we've adopted as well. We, we constantly look at our direct competition, but as well indirect and say like, should we you know, deploy this feature because they've deployed it? And will that add value essentially to our current customer base? That's the first aspect, right? It's more like benchmarking, but the other aspect is really the consumer. So to describe specifically around local, we initially say, okay, local news, you know, we build it, we aggregate all the sources, we categorize it. That was like a pretty long effort. But then we're like, okay, what's next? And I think, you know, asking customers, discussing quality focus group and doing survey, we assess that crime was top of mind, right? When you think local, you're like, is my family safe? I, you know, am I safe? Should I avoid this specific location? Was really top of mind. It happened to be when you watch evening news, often crime stories tend to lead, right? Then you had weather. It's like, you know, weather could impact what I wear, could impact if I do this activity or this one. Same thing, right, as well. Often news and weather tend to be linked in a lot of like newspaper, TV, all this news space. And then, you know, people were sharing uh, a lot of other needs, but we're like, okay, let's add those two offerings right to the product. We partner with actual weather for weather data and build this like weather map. Uh, and for crime as well, we partner with it. A company named Spot Crime that aggregate all the PD reports from everywhere, and we build a crime map so you could, especially if you go to a new city, right? Maybe you don't know the bad areas to avoid. You could just spot that uh, very quickly. Smart. That is so smart. I'm just thinking about that. Even just overall, you know, the hyper local focus because that's what the larger companies and media can't take from you. You know, they'll do their larger takes on the bigger story. But when you've got local, that really does pay off. And it's part of the secret, but not all of it, because you had a presentation at Mal, and I was there, and you discussed the six-step process you have developed to succeed. Now, there's six-point plan. We won't go into all six, but I would love it if you would share one of the more innovative steps in the six-point plan. Yeah. Well, I think the key new thing for me as, as well was really point number four to say, you know, no good campaign plan survives to the contact with the enemy. Uh, and, you know, that's the saying in the military space. But I think it's, it's very true as well for the age we live in. And so in this case, 2020, as you know, was like a major, we were like, hey, you know, there is election in the US, Olympics for Japan, very clear plan. We're going to execute. We're going to win those two key moments. COVID happens, George Floyd death happens, and, and all those moments. And so in this situation, companies could just stick to their guns. Well, Olympics was canceled, so it would have been hard to stick to our gun on this one, but on saying election and only election. Or you could embrace the change in consumer demand, right? And, and be reactive to it. So if there is one thing for me, at least I've learned as a marketer in the last three years, is 
you either embrace this change in consumer demand and, and win, and we more than double our scale in the US, or if you miss out, you know, you're left behind, you're left in the dust. We've seen a bunch of competitors like Flipboard and so on, not provide COVID, COVID data, not provide a bunch of things in a timely manner. And as a result, you know, I mean, their decline have continued. Yeah. I love that. That's uh, super smart. I see that all the time as a journalist. I can say, you know, I, I love this topic. I care about this topic. I'm writing about this topic and, you know, crickets. <laughs> and then something happens and it's big and the whole world is excited about it. You write about it and boom, you, off you go, right? I mean, it's just, it is what it is. We have to bring this to a close. You've got a hard stop. Peggy has wine waiting for her. We cannot <laughs> come between Peggy and wine. No, so don't do it. Or your top. <laughs> you wine, you know, it's just a time difference. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you for your top three tips for mobile marketers, perhaps in the new space coming into, you know, the end of the year here. Yeah. Well, I think my first key tip is you really need to reconnect with the audience and become more holistic marketer because we're moving away from deterministic attribution. It's a matter of time for Android. It's already the case for iOS. So think on who is really your consumer, how could you add value and target them and, and stop just sticking to managing a funnel because that's not what marketing is, right? It's great that you have this knowledge, but actually, you know, it needs to be much more than that. I think the, the second topic will be when it comes to, uh, you know, the, the upcoming, the next year, I think there's sort of key themes who are starting to emerge, right? And key pains both starting to emerge in the population. There is opportunities around those key pain points. And I think make sure your app could embrace it through some of the features you're shipping. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, I think, extremely important, right? We know inflation and it, it's going to be a key matter. We know there are going to be a lot of polarization around the election, but, you know, it's something you could leverage in marketing as well. If anything, to offer maybe an escape from that right, to, to some of the people. Yes. Your product and your we need that. <laughs> yeah, that will be the... You know, my second tip and the third one is, especially if you're a leader, if you're a manager, nurture your team, care about them. It will pay back like big time. I think it's, it's really mission critical, especially now with more distributed team, you should be evaluated by your company and your capability to level up people and provide the data, be a multiplier. Don't be the person that just, you know, check in with them on the progress of work, like help them achieve their goals. And they will help you, you know, in your company to achieve yours. Love it. Love it. Love it. We see your family behind you and your hard stop is probably related to that. So we better let you go. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you, John. Thank you, Peggy. It was really great chatting with you too. Lovely, Fabian. And good luck with the company in stealth mode. I'll be watching for it. And thank you to all listeners. We really do appreciate you. Hope you're enjoying it. Let us know on social if you are. And let us know if you want to come and we'll have you on the show. If you're a mobile hero or you know of someone who is, then fill out the interest form over at shorturl.at forward slash JKSKT. Also, Liftoff has a Slack for mobile heroes and people in the mobile ecosystem. There's a link on the screen. And if you're listening to the podcast, it's at info.liftoff.io slash slack dash sign up. It's pretty cool. There's smart people there. And you know what? They probably need you too. And you have probably been completely blown away by all the insights on this show. And you want your transcript. And you can have it because the transcripts are over at Liftoff's website. Go to liftoff.io, click on heroes, and then click on podcast. I actually personally love transcripts because I read way faster than people talk. So that's a great way to get insights really, really quickly. Until next time, this is John Kutz here. Thank you so much for joining. And this is Peggy Ann Saltz signing off for Mobile Heroes Uncensored. <laughs>